Okay, Father, we just thank you for this time together tonight. If we could ask everybody to stand. Lord, we love you. We dedicate this time to you. Thank you for the koinonia of Restoration Church. We just are hungry for your word. Tenderize our hearts. Make us make our hearts soft and supple, sensitive. May we guard our hearts with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. And I just speak over this, the whole campus, for where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Come on, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except by me, through me. And we praise you. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world. Could we give the Lamb praise? Come on. Let's really offer up tonight. We love you, Lord. We praise you, Father. We honor you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus' name, before you're seated, I'd like to just say this group down here had eight. It's a rebellious spirit down here in it. Everybody just stretch your hand this way right here. There were eight people. Steve was a ringleader. He's been this way his whole life. But Steve Hall, you're going to come and help us get this man set free. All right, you love Jesus? Say yeah. yeah. You can be seated. Let's welcome Dr. Steve Hall again, ladies and gentlemen, to Restoration Church. Thank you, Chuck. Yeah, Appreciate that. Good evening, Restoration Soul family. I got to tell you, it really feels like that for me. I mean, I just had the opportunity to sit in here uh, for, you know, an hour or so in the sanctuary. Just the vibe of the place. Just the, talking to the people that I meet. and Just the vibe of your soul family is rich, and I am grateful to be a part of it. I am blessed each week that I get to come be with you. And I, I'm not typically a commuter person. I don't typically fly weekly places. Like some of you in business, I can't even imagine what it's like to, you know, get up every other day, you know, and fly somewhere and fly back that evening and then go another day, fly somewhere else, fly back. That's an amazing kind of experience. But I have realized how important just a few inches is. I don't know if there's any flight attendants in the room, but I don't know the miraculous experience of what it means to be uncomfortable, comfortable, uh, uh, uncomfortable, comfortable, just, and then all of a sudden it's like I'm in this recline position, and then, and then I have to, I have to make my seat back upright, I don't know if anybody knows why. Is, is there an imbalance in the weight of the plane? Is it dangerous landing? I'm not quite sure what those couple inches really mean. But in any event, I'm just saying, I cherish those. Especially in the middle seat. I cherish those little, little distances. And what I want to bring to your attention out of that is that just little changes, small changes, over time, can be incredibly monumental for your future. So if you perhaps pick up one little thing and you say, I don't know, I might try that open-handed prayer thing. Or I don't know, I'm going to start asking the Holy Spirit into my life. I'm going to set reminders in my phone and do a little minor changes, little dis differences, little adjustments if you're thinking about being here, a little adjustment could mean that you're way over here at a different time as you go into the future. So as we come into this moment, as we engage this material, and tonight's session is a particularly difficult session because we have to really think about ourselves, really think about ourselves with regard to how we engage moving forward. And at the end of our session tonight, like we did last week, there's going to be a little bit of time for us to regather in groups and take some time to cultivate in our community 
what we're experiencing, what we're learning, what we're engaged with, what we feel the Lord moving on us, any type of minor adjustment, any change, any engagement that you might see in this soul health training as we're revealing it, uh, you're going to have that time at the end. But the question for us really is to ask ourselves, how is your soul? And I do want to encourage you to consistently ask that question, how is your soul? Consider asking it of your spouse. Consider, and I recommend, don't ask it after an argument. Or someone that's particularly tense. It's probably not a good idea. Yeah, well, how's your soul right now? That's really unwise. Your, your body's not going to be good if you say that. <laughs> You know, so yeah, be careful what, how you say that, but posture it in a, the, the kindest, the most honest way, and then maybe ask other people, how is your soul? And imagine the conversations you'll have. Imagine waking up in the morning and just sitting in silence and asking the Lord, hey Lord, how's my soul? Just, just that discipline of awaken. And so we've been talking about these training exercises of praying with open hands. We talked last week, a week about reflexive invitation. We talked last week about daily examine and memorizing scripture. I love what Pastor Chuck just did, asking you to speak out the word of God over this congregation. You can't do that if you don't know it. If you haven't hidden the word of God in your heart through the spiritual discipline of memorization, you can't recall it, you can't speak it forth, you can't yield the power of it, the living and active nature of it in your, in your soul. So this idea of memorizing scripture is incredibly critical to how we're moving forward. And I want to invite you right now to again, pray with me at the beginning of this session as a matter of confession where we are telling the Lord, we are confessing to the Lord what we would like to see happen. And it requires us to what I would often say in my own little lingo, it's time to push in the clutch. When you push in the clutch, tension is relieved. Shift into neutral. Some of you have been grinding it all day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you've been in fifth gear. You've been pedal to the metal, as fast and furious as you can go. You felt that tension, and you came in here, and you sat down right now. And you might be asking yourself, wow, I just wish I was home in the recliner, sleep, napping. But right now, you're here, and I want to invite you to push in the soul clutch, shift into neutral, and give God the opportunity to reveal himself to you tonight. So, as we pray with open hands, I want to encourage you to confess this with me. Would you hold your hands open in front of you, forcing them open? It takes effort. It takes intention to do this. And let's confess this together. God, I choose to slow my breath and relinquish my worries. I open my hands to pray. Come, Holy Spirit, to my mind. I receive your comfort. Come, Holy Spirit, to my heart. I receive your peace. Come, Holy Spirit, to my soul. I receive the Father's love for me. I am the that you have for me today. I had a beautiful testimony the other day in a course that I was teaching. And one of the older folks in the room has four children. And he said, Dr. Hall, I, I did something that shook up our family. When we went to say grace for our meal, I said, okay, let's say grace. And all the kids did what they normally did. They closed their hands. And I said, hey, let's start a new tradition in the family. Setting ourselves up and honkering down, so to speak. What, what if we just opened ourselves before the Lord to receive and to give? Lord, you give, you take away, blessed be your name. And he said it was just a real change in the atmosphere. So again, little tiny adjustments making a big difference in the way in which our life trajectory ends up. 
Let's do a little bit of review so that we can understand what, where we've come from. We've done a lot of talk, and I'm talking about basically last week and understanding that the, the holistic nature of our soul that I am advocating is an awareness that everything about your life, we talked about it again last week, that passage where Jesus is talking about gaining the whole world and losing your own soul, and he, and he interchangeably uses life and soul, life and soul. It's the same word, suke, as he exhibits the fact that life and soul is the same thing by and large. And it involves everything, that sense of will being the epicenter, the heart of ourselves, the will creating. God to surrender. Why? Because God expected humanity to surrender to him and his will. Jesus prayed that your will might be done, not mine. Jesus prayed, Lord, your will on earth as in heaven. The will is intended to surrender. So this idea of willpower, just mustering it up, sucking it up, us generating willpower is in fact antithetical to the way in which God created us to surrender. But often we surrender to the wrong things. We surrender to bitterness. We surrender to anger. We surrender to resentment. We surrender to offense. We surrender to all these negative experiences, to, to comfort and convenience and pleasure as, a, as the ultimate good of life. We surrender to these kinds of things, status, acquisition, all of that we talked about recently. And that sets the tone for the mind and the thinking and the feelings and the body and the, and the social relationships that we have. All of this is critically important to understand that the effective range of God's will is indeed his kingdom. And when God has your will surrendering to his will more and more and more, we arise, we grow up, as Paul said, into the full stature of Christ. And that means that everything from our eating and drinking all the way to our parenting, our sex life, our money, the way we drive, all of it is brought under the effective range of God's will and we are restoring what we lost in Eden. It's all about integration. Now, we talked about this holistic nature of life. We talked about that we often separate out all of these little zones of life. You know, we don't necessarily think all that much about God and all of our eating. We might have a little bit of grace, and then bam, we're into the eating, and that's all we really think about. Uh, you know, when we have food or sports, you know, how do, we, how do we play soccer as if it was Jesus playing soccer? How do we golf as if it was Jesus golf? How do we play board games? How do we play rock, paper, scissors? As if Jesus were playing it. How, how do we engage watching sports, engaging in sports, trash talking with other people about sports? How would we do that if it was Jesus in us doing it? Gardening, pets, house chores, church, everything brought into the sacred life. I shared with you that quote from A.W. Tozer about let a person sanctify the Lord God in their heart and they can thereafter do no common act. For that person, every act is sacred. In that person, the whole world is a sanctuary. Imagine seeing even your cubicle at work or the truck you drive for work or, or, the, or the desk office at home as, a, as part of the sanctuary and your spreadsheets as sacred offering to God. All of these things, this holistic vision of the sacred life. And we talked about the ultimate goal for citizens of, the, of God's kingdom is ultimately Christ-likeness. Why? Because Christ is the perfect example of the human being that God created us to be. And as we become more like Christ, we become more like the person whom we were originally created to be. And the centerpiece, as I'm advocating, the centerpiece of Christ-likeness is contentment. And the secret source of soul health is contentment in Christ. Think about the world we live in and the discontentedness of the world and how that COVID threw gas on that discontent. And then the political ugliness and the racial ugliness and all of the other social media ugliness and the isolation and the toxicity of our culture 
discontent. In fact, our own capitalistic engine, which I love and I wouldn't want to be a part of any other system, our own capitalistic engine is fueled by consumerism. Amazon would go out of business tomorrow if everyone decided they were content. Who would be, who would be like dialing up Amazon and buying stuff they don't need if they were feeling content? The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Wow. The world lives in such discontent in this, but the secret source of soul health is contentment in Christ. The secret, and I say a secret because so many people, even church folks, longtime Christians, even Christians that have been a Christian for 60 years, often seem so discontent. I've found in my experience with folks who are getting older and older and older, into their 70s and 80s, often are becoming so toxic, so angry, so frustrated. It's unbelievable. You know, this is a secret. Young people with their insatiable desire for acquiring and more and success and ambition and, and it's just a secret that so many people don't seem to know. The secret of contentment in Christ is a learned orientation of soul over a long disciplined season where the will is conditioned to value the metrics of the kingdom of God. We talked about those. Not the metrics of the kingdom of the world. This conditioning, this training yields contentment over time. It is not instantaneous. You are not going to be able to go to drive through Restoration Church. Pastor Chuck is not going to be able to set up a, a drive through out there and say, come through, get your contentment. Your flat white contentment with, you know, your two shots of espresso or whatever it is. You know, you, you know you're not going to be able to drive through and get a cup of contentment. And it takes a, a long obedience in the same direction as Eugene Peterson said. And the question is, does this describe you? A tranquil soul, assured of your salvation through Christ, fearing nothing, trusting God, content with any earthly circumstance. Imagine if this was the epicenter of your parenting. It was the ethos of your home. It was the vibe that you brought to work. This. Imagine the contrast that a church community in a society of ambient anxiety and discontentment, a church community content, assured of their salvation through Christ, fearing nothing, trusting God, content with any earthly circumstance. Goodness gracious, that is a contrast community. That is countercultural. And this is what Paul had to say about it. For I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through Christ who gives me strength. I had an opportunity to experience that sense of you know, the secret, um, practicing what I preach as Banks and I came from the um, airport to the church. And we, and we happened, I was, I was dying for some coffee. I was needing that afternoon coffee fix. And I said, and Banks happened to say that he loved coffee. And immediately I said, oh, we're brothers in coffee. Christ, yes, but coffee right now. And he's like, dude, I got the place for you. He didn't really say, dude, but I always make a person a surfer anyway. You know, he didn't really say this. So, so I'm just pretending Banks is a surfer, not a fly fisherman. So Banks, the surfer, said, dude, I got a place for you. And it was a perfect spot that I got this coffee from, really wonderful coffee. Warm waves in, in downtown Alfreda, right? Warm waves. Somebody in this church is associated with that. Yeah, they own it. Okay, awesome. You know, so it's really, really good coffee. And so, you know, I was discontent until I found a brother in coffee. So I have to work on that. We have to work on that every day. We have enemies every day that are engaged in trying to thwart the idea of, of the secret of being content in every situation. 
And I can do all this through Christ who strengthens me. Do you, can your children see that? Can your spouse see that? Can your coworkers see that? This is the contrast it, community that is, is the essence of evangelism. Because if you proclaim the gospel of Jesus but can't live contented in Christ, how incoherent is that? What difference does Jesus really make? And so I'm inviting you into this epicenter of surrendering our will to God, Lord, whether I'm well fed or whether I'm hungry, whether I have much or whether in need, I surrender myself to you, Lord. Your will, not mine, be done. Your will on earth as it is in heaven. This is us embodying, living out this secret of contentment, and it is the epicenter of soul health, and no one gets lucky with contentment. No one can say, man, I'm, gonna, man, I'm showing up at church on Sunday, and man, I sure hope, I sure hope I can, I can pull the preacher, you know, lever, and maybe Pastor Chuck's wheels will spin, and then all of a sudden there'll be this jackpot. Maybe, maybe Pastor Chuck is going to help me hit the jackpot this week. And then you walk out and say, yeah, well, didn't win this week, you know. I didn't get lucky. Contentment is not about luck. Contentment is about cultivation. Contentment is about conditioning. Contentment is is only achieved over a long period of time with obedience in the same direction. Contentment is cultivated. It is slow, and we hate slow. We hate slow in our culture, in our Western world. We rebel against it. We want it quick. We want it fast. We want it shorter. I don't know if you know this or not, but in my own world of psychology, in the 2000s, the attention span of a human being was considered to be 21 seconds in the 2000s. Right now, it's considered to be 8 seconds. The attention span, the normal average attention span of a human being. And I, you probably don't know this, but it's true. Uh, a goldfish attention span is nine seconds. We're, we're losing to a goldfish. Contentment is cultivated because God's speed is slow. And God, like we talked last week, is not going to speed up and yell louder and you know, chase you down, God is going to be there consistently with a still small voice speaking to you, inviting you in. Contentment is cultivated by a long obedience in the same direction because God's speed is slow. And if we don't synchronize with God's speed by slowing our breath, I choose to slow my breath. I choose to to put myself in a position of soul serenity. I choose that. What is that? That is you willfully surrendering to the speed of God. Not running ahead and yelling, come on, God, speed up! But slowing down to match God's speed. The first step in the how of soul health is to unlearn soul unhealth. Many of us live in a rhythm or a lifestyle of soul unhealth. And that's not anybody's fault, really. We're born into a world that's broken, and ultimately we struggle with developing healthy soul practices because the tension of our brokenness is always moving us towards unhealthy soul practices. The scripture is clear. Don't copy the behaviors and the customs of this world, but let God transform you. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. The the question is in being born again is before we are born again, we are essentially raised by the world. The world, our brokenness, is our parent. And then we are born again, and we are born again into a new family, and we have a new parent. And now we're under God's purview. We are being raised anew with God, no longer according to the traditions and the customs of the world's raising, but now we are being raised, as one of your classes is indicating, as citizens of the kingdom of God. And that requires a learning. It's a learning curve. 
But let God transform you. Let God. What's that word let? Will. Surrender your will. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And that word nous there, a Greek word, is all about a holistic sense of knowing. Not just information and facts, not just figures, not just rattling off trivia because you remember it. It's not about that. It's about a knowledge, a knowing of the world. Really, you could transliterate this word as worldview, a vision of the world. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And so what we've got to do is that we have to recognize that there are impediments to soul health. And this is the hard part of this series. This is is that middle part, that really hard part, that if we don't get down, if we don't understand our unhealth, we're going to have a very difficult time moving towards health. So these are the things that we need to address as impediments to soul health. What to unlearn, if you will. And I'd say, number one, believing lies. Let's talk about some lies in which we believe. God may love you, but doesn't like you. How many of us have felt that with regard to our own kids That we're like, oh man, this is a good thing, I love you. (laughs) Because I snuff you out. (laughs) You know, we have that sense, that vision, you know, where we're annoyed, we're irritated, and we communicate the fact that, yes, we love you, but man, we're annoyed and irritated, and we don't like you very much. I get that. But God sees the end from the beginning. He not only loves you, he likes you. Why does he like you? Because he sees what you will be. One of these days, God is going to give you a a stone, and that stone's going to have your name on it, and it's it's a name that only you and God know, and finally, you're going to be that person that you have always intended to be, and man, does God like that person. What a vision. God loves you, and he likes you. You know, when we have kids, we have kids because we have a vision of what they're going to be like, and does anybody imagine your child to be a petulant 13-year-old? No, or no one would have children. But you, you have a vision of this glorious little child, beautiful, cute, kind, always respectful, always makes their bed, so sweet, educated, successful. We have a vision of that, and that's our vision. Well, I want you to know that even though sometimes our kids don't necessarily turn out that way as we envision them, you're going to turn out exactly how God envisions you. Because he is the author and the finisher of your faith. And that work he began in you, he's faithful to complete it. Listen to this incredible statement from, uh, Chuck, can I have my glasses? I I, I left them over there. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thomas Akempis wrote this incredible book called The, The Imitation of Christ. And he says these words, I just told you that God likes you. And he likes you because he knows you. He sees in you what you don't see. And he's got you right where he wants you. And he's going to teach you. Relax. It's okay. All that he desires in you is within yourself. And there it is his pleasure to be. Somebody look up Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5. Ephesians 1 verse 5. NLT. I want to NLT. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, NLT. Read this again, then I'm going to ask who's got it. All that he desires in you is within yourself. And there it is his pleasure to be. Who's got that? Okay, thank you. NLT. You always read. Let's let somebody else read. Go ahead. Just stand up and belt it out. Oh, NLT. Okay, we default to Chuck. Oh, she's got it. Oh, Chuck's out again. Yeah, you. And it was his great...
thank you. And it gave him great pleasure. It sounds like he likes you. It sounds like he likes you. And he wants to meet you in you, to transform you in the kind of person that he knows you're going to be. What other lies do we often believe? You are worthless and deserve to be treated poorly. You're destined to be a failure. You've committed the unforgivable sin. You're not really saved. You can't trust anyone. Everyone must be like, every, everyone must like you to have value. How many of us struggle with these kinds of lies that have been built into us from the kingdom of the world, perhaps by broken parents or broken school teachers or broken coaches that build lies into us and we begin to adopt them because we believe them for so long, they've become neural pathways in our minds and now we just fall into the rut of those lies and we continue to believe them and it makes it impossible for us to believe what God believes about us, which is the truth. What are the lies that you believe? Jesus experiences, and I love this passage out of Mark 1. Suddenly, while they were still in the meeting place, he was interrupted by a man yelling out, What business do you have here with us, Jesus, Nazarene? I know what you're up to. You're the Holy One of God, and you've come to destroy us. And Jesus shut him up. Quiet. Get out of him. Look at him and him. It's like he's talking to two different people. Jesus shut him up, who was saying all those ugly things. And then Jesus said to that person, get out of him. Jesus distinguished between the oppressive power that was making the man's life miserable and the man himself. He can see your li the lies that you believe, but he also can see you. He can see what you really are. The afflicting spirit threw the man into, some, into spasms, protesting loudly. And don't lies protest loudly? Don't those negative voices protest loudly? And get out! Everyone there was spellbound, buzzing with curiosity. What's going on here? A new teaching that does what it says? He shuts up defiling demonic spirits and tells them to get lost. And that same Jesus lives in you. That same Jesus who cast out lying spirits lives in you. And as you surrender your will to the will of God rather than the will of lies and the will of this world, it is Jesus who speaks into those lies with a power beyond you and cast out those evil things. And he tells them to get lost. I love that. So, impediments to soul health, believing lies and also passive faith. So, passive faith, what is that? That's thinking we're going to get lucky with faith. If we just, you know, attend church long enough, if we go on that retreat, maybe we'll get lucky on the men's retreat. If we go to the women's event, maybe we'll get lucky at the women's event. You know, and we'll just, maybe somehow, some way. I'll just keep pulling the handle of church and seeing if I can't hit. It's that idea of passive faith. There's a little bit of effort in it, but unfortunately with the attitude that it's luck and maybe somehow I'll dial it in if I get lucky. Passive faith, leaving faith to the professionals. I'm going to come to church and watch Pastor Chuck and Shelly do faith. And I like seeing them do faith every Sunday. But that's really not possible for me to do. Thinking that somehow, some way, you're not a priest in the priesthood of believers. That somehow, some way, the professionals know what they're doing. They've been trained. We're just hapless followers. No, 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 no. Leaving faith to the professionals is really a passive faith that impedes soul health. Confusing faith and feeling. I don't really feel very content right now. And it's my feelings that tell me whether I'm content or not because, of course, my whole life is led by my feelings. And you know what? I've, I was given a compliment at work, and now I'm up. Then I came home, and I was given a negative, and now I'm down. And we're up, and we're down, and we're up, and we're down. Hey! You own your feelings. No one else owns your feelings. Because when your will surrenders to the truth of God about you, 
your mind is thinking appropriately and your feelings naturally follow and you begin to believe the truth of God and you cut through all of the ups and downs of feelings and you have this trend line that shoots through and it is the truth of God about you and that takes discipline. Rather than just being tossed around on the waves of life, being able to recognize you're floating rather than fighting is a way in which we stop confusing faith and feelings because faith is truth and feeling is whimsical. Faith is stable. Feeling is not. Unless our will is surrendered to God, unless we're believing the truth about ourselves, and that means we have to activate faith even in times where we don't quite feel like it. Impediments to the soul. Believing lies, passive faith, and attachments. Attachments, this is going to be challenging to think about, but it's critical to soul health if we don't unlearn attachments. Attachment is this. An emotional state of clinging caused by the belief that without some particular thing or person, you cannot be content. You are hanging your contentment on something you desperately want to have or want to keep or don't want. It's your attachment to that thing or that person that if you don't have, you're going to not be content. And this is why we pray with open hands. Lord, you give, you take away. Blessed be your name. So that we are releasing to the best of our ability, at least we're symbolically releasing our attachments. What would an attachment be like? Perhaps a job promotion. We get so wrapped around the axle about a job promotion. If we don't get it, we're going to be devastated. This is an attachment a clinging to something that we say, if we don't get it, we are going to be miserable. We're going to be discontent. Getting married, having children, being liked, approved, succeeding. These are all metrics that the world encourages us to attach ourselves to. And if we can't have them, if we don't get them, then we are discontent. And ultimately... Our sense of faith and soul health is corrupted because we are constantly attaching ourselves to the things of this world. Instead of, the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything that I need, it's, the Lord is my shepherd, but he better give me this, or I need him to do this for me, or I'm going to be miserable, I'm going to be so mad, I'm going to be so upset. Why do we, why do, we do that? Why do we ad- ad- anticipate Negativity. Why do we anticipate a sense of despair, a sense of discontentment, when we can anticipate the peace and shalom of God in our life? Again, it's changing the way we think. We approach the world by releasing attachments. Attachments have two parts to them, a positive part and a negative part. The positive part is the excitement or thrill that you experience when you get what you're attached to. (laughs) I got the promotion! Yes! I feel so good! It's wonderful! Life is going great! And you walk out the next morning and your car won't start. I'm so mad! Why me? Always me! Always me! Again, we're attached. It's got to work perfectly. My kid's got to do the right thing, or I'm going to be miserable. Everything's got to fall into place. You know, the health report's got to be right, and the car's got to work, and the internet's got to stay up and can't go down, and if I don't get this promotion, if my wife doesn't talk nice to me, if my kids don't obey me, I'm going to be miserable. But when it happens, when our kids make their bed and the rooms are clean, and then all of a sudden we feel great. The excitement or thrill you experience when you get what you're attached to. The negative part is the sense of threat or tension or fear of not getting or losing the attachment. I've got to have this contract. has got to come through. Then the contract comes through, and now you're afraid of losing the contract. The promotion comes through. 
The marriage happens. Will he love me forever? What happens if I get sick? Will he still stay with me? Will she like me if I gain weight or blah, 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 blah? And we're always worried. And what if my kids get involved in another crowd or a bad crowd? And oh my gosh, you know, I had kids and I was so thrilled. Now I'm worried to death about the... On and on and on. We have these attachments that as we attach ourselves to even good things, it inhibits our soul health. Let's look at some things about Jesus and attachment. If you want to be perfect, and perfect, by the way, is a word for completeness in the Greek, just wholeness. It's a, it's a word of holistic sense and feeling and things coming together in balance as God intended it from the beginning. So if you want to be like you were created to be, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Attachments will keep your soul sick. I tell you the truth, it's very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say it again, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, attachments will keep your soul sick. Luke 14, so you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Attachments will keep you sick. Is Jesus saying empty your bank accounts and turn all the money over to Restoration Church? Yes. Just kidding. I, I felt that from Chuck. And... No, he's not talking about that at all. He's, he, he's actually just simply saying give up your attachment to it. Give up your clinging to it. When you are free from clinging to it, you have to have it or you're going to be miserable. If you don't, if your retirement doesn't reach this much, then I'm going to be devastated. And we're hanging our hat, we're hanging our soul health, our holistic shalom on this thing. He says, if you don't give everything up, release everything, know that I am your shepherd, you will be soul sick. Luke 5, 11, and when they had brought their boats to, to land, they left everything and followed him. Attachments will keep your soul sick. If you love your father and mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. Is Jesus saying he doesn't want you to love your children or your family? No, he's saying that there is a healthy attachment that ultimately cannot get in the way of your connection, attachment to God. Attachments other than those of loving God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your body. This keeps your soul sick. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give it up, your, if you have up your life for me, you will find it. Again, praying with open hands. With clenched fist, as we go through life with clenched fist, we live soul-sick lives. Jesus and attachments. The key to contentment is ordering your loves. What you are is what you love. Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. When we get our prioritization correct, when our highest attachment, in the first session we talked about priorities, our highest priority is loving God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our body, our whole being, our whole life. And ultimately, Jesus is saying, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. When we are seeking the promotion first or we're going to be devastated, we are attached to a thing of this world and it's it's, it's the cart before the horse. The issue is, is that when we love these things of the world more than we love God, we have disordered loves, and ultimately we're getting the cart before the horse, the horse being our love for God, all this other stuff falling into place as we make him our shepherd. Matthew 22, the great commandment. There's a wonderful story about a traveling uh, preacher, 
and it was in a desert area, and so he would walk from one town to another town, and there's usually some space between them through the desert, and as he was walking through this desert area, it was a dry uh, riverbed uh, in this particular season when he was going to the next town, he happened to see something kind of sparkling over on the side, they looked to be a little rock slide, he went over and he picked it up and he said, wow, this is really interesting, this is amazing, you know, it was like rock maybe about as big as, as a volleyball. And he shoves it in his backpack, and he walks on, and he goes to the next town, and he takes up residence with the, the, one of the local elders in the town, because he's there to do some Christian ministry. And he, he lives with, and he, sh- he takes this, this uh, he, he, he hears this elder saying all of this trouble that he's got, talking about all the trouble he's having. And the, and the only way really to fix his trouble, his wife's health problems, his dilapidated house, his troubled car, his kids needing tuition. He was unburdening himself on this elder. And the elder was like, my gosh, I'm so sorry. I hate that you're in this situation. I realize your medical bills, wow, that's terrible. You got a leaky roof over here. Mold could develop. Yeah, I'm hearing you, man. That's terrible. I'm so sorry. And they prayed about it. And then the preacher went back to his room, and he opened up his his backpack, and he got that rock out, and he walked over, and he said, I don't know if this would help, but would this help you? And the guy took it, and he was like, (gasps) because it was a raw, uncut diamond, as big as a volleyball. And the guy said, would it help? It would answer everything. And the preacher said, "Well, well, take it. I'm so happy to give it to you. And the guy was like, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And the preacher went on to bed, and the guy went into his room, and he, and he put it under his bed, and he hid it, and he made sure it was in a really safe place, and he paced all night long with his wife, and they were celebrating, and they were so happy, they were unbelievably happy. And the next morning, he got up, and he went to find the preacher, and the preacher was gone. And the preacher had gone on to the next town already. And then throughout the day, he needed to see the preacher, and he put that diamond in his backpack and he went to see the preacher and he found the preacher in the next town and he said to the preacher, hey, hey, thank God I found you, I found you, I need, to, I need to give you something. And he pulled the diamond out and he gave it back to the preacher. And the preacher said, why are you giving me this? I thought this was going to answer all your problems. He said, throughout the night and all day long, I've been so anxious about this thing. I realized through my prayers with the Lord and sitting in communion with him, that what I needed more than this diamond was the ability to give it away. What I needed far more was not the riches of this diamond, but what I needed more was the ability to give it away. When we grab on and we cling to attachments and we say we can't be content, we can't be at peace. We can't have shalom unless we get this. When we open our hands before the Lord and we give it up, we find freedom and peace. Attachments will keep your soul sick. Impediments to soul health. Hurry. Hurry. Hurry is a sin sickness. A hurry, listen to this, a hurried lifestyle is a habit of thinking and feeling characterized by continual rushing and anxiousness. Hello. Anybody know anybody like that? Of course it's not you at all. (laughs) Sword and Zimbaro say this, a disease, a hurry is a disease in which a person feels chronically short of time and so tends to perform every task faster, getting flustered when they encounter any kind of delay. The famous psychiatrist Carl Jung said, hurry is not of the devil, hurry is the devil. The number one challenge you will face in achieving contentment is time. If you're going to, be, you're going to experience Christ-likeness and you're going to grow up into the full stature of Christ-likeness, you've got to settle this contentment. The number one challenge is going to be time. People... This is, uh, I think, a reality. People are just too busy to live emotionally healthy and spiritually rich, vibrant lives. Sure. The number one challenge you will face in achieving contentment is time. People are just too busy to live emotionally healthy and spiritually rich and vibrant lives in our current culture. 
You know you live a hurried life when your checkout line moves too slow. When you multitask in the bathroom. I heard some people doing that tonight. Just saying. I, can, I, I know the shoes. When you set reminders for your reminders. When you lose sleep over your schedule, when people just won't get to the point. Have you ever talking to someone going, well, are they ever going to get to the point? I got to get, I want to, uh. You know, you can't stand to just be present with someone and listen to a story. Uh, when eating, working, and driving coexist. And I would say personal hygiene. When eating, personal hygiene, working, and driving all coexist. When I see a woman using a, a, a plug-in curling iron going down the street, you know, on the freeway. It, 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 is, it is hurry sickness that's involved. Listen to this. The Charleston uh, Southern University School of Business conducted obstacles of growth survey. Over 20,000 Christians across the globe and, and, and identified business, busyness as a major distraction from spiritual life. Listen carefully to their hypothesis. You're going to have to dial in here, tune in here. Quote, it may be the case that Christians are assimilating, or as I've said, syncretizing, to a culture of busyness, hurry, and overload, which leads to God becoming more marginalized in Christians' lives, which leads to a deteriorating relationship with God, which leads to Christians becoming even more vulnerable to adopting secular assumptions about how to live. That's nous in Romans 12, too which leads to more conformity to a culture of busyness, hurry, and overload, and then the cycle of soul disease begins again. Hurry and love are incompatible. John Mark Coomer, beautiful book on the ruthlessness of, the ruthless elimination of hurry. All my worst moments as a father, a husband, and a pastor, even as a human being, are when I am in a hurry. Late for an appointment, behind on my unrealistic to-do list, trying to cram too much into my day, I ooze anger, tension, a critical nagging, and it is the antithesis of love. A hurried life and the great commandment are incompatible. So you might ask yourself, how in the world in the West can we actually be Christians? <laughs> we live a hurry-sick life. A hurried life and the great commandment are incompatible. Now, you could co-opt the great commission into your life of hurry. But you would be living with the cart before the horse again. The horse is being with God. The cart is doing for God. Before you can effectively do for God, you must effectively be with God. This is the ordered life. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things, even evangelism and discipleship, will fall into place behind you. That's the horse and the cart. Again, does this describe you? A tranquil soul, full of shalom, assured of your salvation through Christ, fearing nothing, trusting God's sovereignty, content with any earthly circumstance. This is shalom. This is soul health. The general characteristic of your life of a deep sense of contentment in Christ no matter what the circumstances. A contented and hurried life are mutually exclusive. You can't have both in the same life. A hurried parent and a good parent. You can't be a hurried spouse and a good spouse. You can't be a hurried Christian and a good Christian. Now, by contentment, I do not mean that you don't move fast. If you step out of your house and there's, like in my case, an alligator there, moving slow is not wise. You know, if you see a car coming and your child's in the street, you don't stroll. You move fast. You can, if you're missing your plane, you can run. 
It doesn't, contentment doesn't mean that you're not entrepreneurial or ambitious, that you're complacent or lazy, that you don't plan. Contentment does mean while you move fast, pursue ambitions, and make plans, you do so content that you trust God and live in peace and shalom whatever happens. Hurry and contentment are enemies. They are enemies. So what if you told everyone this week, oh, hey, how you doing? Fine, I'm not in a hurry. Try that. Talk to people at the, at the drive-thru. Hey, how you doing today? Fine, I'm not in a hurry. I, I, would, I would hesitate to tell your boss you're not in a hurry. But you could live like it and do really good work, but not hurried and anxious and fearful. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money or mammon. Now, mammon is just a metaphor for anything that we cling to, anything that is an attachment. If we're enslaved to it, we're not going to be able to serve God effectively. We will, dis we will disorient our soul health. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't, they, they don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But oftentimes Christians look just like them. But your heavenly Father already knows all of your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for the Lord will bring its own, for that will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. I need you to know that hurry is learned. You didn't get here because of any other reason except that it's learned. You learned it in your community. Ever met a Jamaican who was hurried or worried? Unplug you, plug them in, and all of a sudden, hey, ma, no problem. Our culture has conditioned us to live hurried, worried lives. Hurry is motivated by fear of losing our attachments. It is worry. Contentment is in Christ is achieved by unlearning. You won't get lucky with contentment. It takes unlearning the ways of the world and relearning the ways of Jesus, the light and free life of Matthew 11. This is what it means to be born again and raised by God rather than the world. For I have learned... And that word, manthano, in the Greek, how to be content with whatever I have. Manthano means the active pursuit of knowledge intended for practice. If you are going to learn contentment, you will have to unlearn hurry. Jesus, are you tired? Worn out? Burned out on religion? And his code word there for religion is works-based performance-based religion. Take that into your life. Works-based, performance-based life. Are you burned out? Are you worn out chasing the things of this world, clinging to the things of this world, demanding, desperately pursuing the things of this world? Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Would you like to live freely and lightly? This is the, this is the observable, ostensible person who is deeply saturated in soul health where at the center of them is submission of their will to the will of God. They have learned the secret to be content in all circumstances, and they are now living in the unforced rhythms of life, grace, and they are living light, and they are living free. So I'd like to take a few minutes, like five to seven minutes, and invite you, like we did last week, to get in circles of four to seven people. There's a lot of grace there. Four to seven people. 
okay, even eight, I, you know, but you can get into however, you know, these groups. Just, just right now, for the next few minutes, would you turn to your neighbor and get in those groups and say, this is what I'm hearing, and then speak. Go ahead, let's do this. And then Pastor Chuck and myself will come back and we'll, we'll process a little bit with you like we did last week.
All right, buzz kill. We got about 30 seconds. Wrap up, 30 seconds. All right, if we could gather back our attention. I'm going to want to, to hear from some of you. Pastor Chuck is going to come up and perhaps have some interaction with you as well. Uh, and uh, by the way, while we're doing this little transition, I just want to thank Lou Trino so much. He is an unbelievable rock star of competence. And I mean, I sat... I sat here as a guest speaker with complete and total confidence. I wasn't worried about a thing. I mean, he just, he just does stuff I don't even think about. It's just beautiful. Thank you, Lou. Uh, so, uh, Pastor Chuck, you can come on up if you want and uh, tell me. I just want some people from your groups. You don't have to tell me what other people said, but just from you and your group, you were able to verbalize what you were thinking, what you're hearing. So I want to know what you're hearing. What, what are you hearing? Just talk to me. What are you hearing? Thank you. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are close beside me. Yes. So our, our, it, that's really easy to do. Just give up our worries, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just really easy. So again, this is, a, this is unlearning. We've, we've been born into a culture of worry and anxiety, ambient anxiety, ambient fear, you know, all kinds, everything's a da danger, especially in COVID times, you know, everything was a danger, you know, you can't, everyone, everyone could kill you, you know, it's crazy, but in any event, you know, so it's discipline, unlearning, what, what, are, you, what are you hearing, what, what have you been hearing in our sessions, yes, in the back, just... Attachments. The whole world is promoting attachments. Ah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, attachments. I had a, when I was pastoring the previous church I was at for 30 years, had a, I had someone tell me that so-and-so left my church. I said, what? Why? You didn't like their post. <laughs> they needed me to like their post. <laughs> what are you hearing? The Holy Spirit say to you, what are you hearing? Yes. I'm sorry, the lady right here? Uh huh. I love that.
Yeah, I, I mean, I get up once or twice a night, but it's not the Lord that wakes me up. Uh, but maybe the Lord's using that. Good point. Yeah, that's a very good point, yeah. Yes, good point. How can we be, how can we have a holy discontent about unrighteousness in the world and the way things are, but yet be completely at peace and shalom knowing that he's working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So how do we live in that tension? We live from the internal character of Christ, which indeed is shalom, peace, a non-anxious presence, as we talked about Edward Freeman saying last week, that is the greatest leadership quality, a non-anxious presence. One last, really brief, really quick. Yes. Uh, Oh, wow. Thank you for sharing that, your own insight to say, oh my goodness, I need to slow down. I've been, I've been trying to be content, but now I just need to slow down. Uh, I, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to offer you another option uh, of soul training before we leave tonight. Just take a, a minute or so, and then Pastor Chuck can come up and dismiss. But we've talked about open-handed prayer. We've talked about reflexive invitation. We've talked about daily exam and we've talked about memorizing scripture, but I want to invite you into a a spiritual practice that is as ancient as the first century and it's called Visio Divina and it simply means soul staring. It simply means looking with your soul. And so I'm going to share with you a picture and I'm going to ask you to stare at it and I would like for you to listen to the scripture as you stare at this picture and listen for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, 
love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. Father, forgive us our sinfulness as we forgive those who sin against us. Be gentle with one another, sensitive. Forgive one another as quickly and thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. So, chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline. Be even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you. And regardless of what, el what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic all-purpose garment. Never be without it. In order to learn love, we have to give up and unlearn resentment. We have to unlearn getting a pound of flesh from our enemies. We have to unlearn the retribution spirit. We have to unlearn condemnation. When you're leaving tonight, I've prepared these little cards. There's a bunch of them down here in the front and over on the speakers, this corner back there. I put them on chairs over here. It's a picture of Rembrandt's The Return of the Prodigal. Henry Nouwen's written, written a beautiful book on this painting from a spiritual soul-staring perspective. It's, it's visio divina at its best. If you would like to learn more about that practice, you're welcome to grab one of these. It's got the story of the prodigal on the back, a picture of Rembrandt's interpretation of it on the front, and just stare at it and let the Holy Spirit bring to you what he might be saying. Be quiet and just stare with your soul. Pastor Chuck. Steve, this is great, man. Um, I want to just distill down just, you know, to me, it's, this is very convicting. And we need it. Amen? And it's truth. So, second thing is, Holy Spirit, you're going to have to do a transformative work in us. And he is able. Amen? Jesus in us, you know, working. And then I thought, I'm going to answer a question for you that I'm going to ask you. Um, like, yeah, um, Candace does this for me. Um, I learned it from her. You know, I wonder if you could, of all the scriptures we've heard just tonight, um, you know, what, what would be like the secret sauce verse? And the Holy Spirit may be giving you something different, but it's as simple as seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be added unto you, you know? And um, it's that, those two guys that were in that chopping wood contest and they had eight hours. And the guy that lost knew the other guy cheated because he had more wood chopped at the end of the day. And he, he just knew he cheated. And he said, I know I won. You, ha you got wood from somebody somewhere else because I saw you every hour on the hour. You took a 10-minute break. And the guy said, do you know what I was doing? He said, no. I just saw you over there sitting down. He said, well, I was turned. All you could see was my back. 
because I was sharpening my axe. And I think in spiritual terms, if we can learn, seek first his kingdom. How many of you know if you get your prayer time, your devotion in in the morning, you get a whole lot more done that day? Anybody else out there? You know, so this is convicting. Holy Spirit's going to have to do a transformative work. And if we seek first the kingdom, Holy Spirit's going to do it. Can I get a witness? Chuck, next week um, we're going to talk about um, a bit of drawing on my psychology background, neuroscience, about how the brain works, also neural pathways and how to condition our soul with regard to using our mind, and then also how to live from a place of rest and not exhaustion. Dude, dude. <laughs> You're such a surfer. Um, and this is the other half of church. We talk yeah. a good bit about that and what the Holy Spirit does and renewing us. Have y'all enjoyed this again? Come on, let's give the Lord praise and express our love and appreciation, Steve. All right, let's stand. Father, thank you for good truth. Thank you for truth. Thank you for Holy Spirit that we're not just left here overwhelmed going, how in the world? It's your spirit in us. And thank you, Lord. The day has come where you put your mind in us. You put your spirit in us. And you're writing your word on our hearts. Hallelujah. Thank you for that, that we've been sealed by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, and one more shout out. Warm waves isn't the only great coffee. Rise coffee and tea also. Can I get a witness? Come on, Nicole. Raise your hand over there. And uh, they're over off of 92 in Sandy Plains. And uh, we got like three different coffee shop owners. So we are an equal opportunity coffee-loving church. Y'all have a great night. I love you.